There's some seats up at the front. We welcome you to come up front. We're going to get started on our most excellent day. I'm Bill Trailer, the president of Richmond Housing Resources and the chair of the network's board of directors. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the network's annual conference, and my specific job is to rev you up for all that lay ahead today. Are you ready? Yeah. Woo! Very good. Very good. You're raring to go. I wish you could all see what I see from up here. It is, you are amazing. Your numbers are daunting. Your commitment to justice is palpable and unstoppable. Your diversity is beautiful. You, each one of you, is what makes supportive housing work. You make supportive housing the solution to all the unstoppable or unsolvable quote unquote problems. Because for you, for all of us, there are no problems. There are only people, our people, our neighbors, our tenants, our loved ones, our friends. That is what makes supportive housing powerful and such a success. We learned long, long ago that our work starts and ends in a very privileged relationship with another person. And within that relationship, we gain as much as the other person, our resident, our tenant, our client, our consumer. I'd like to share a very personal story with you about supportive housing and the power of relationship to, to transform two lives. 30 years ago, I was a, 20, a young 20-something, fresh out of graduate school and a newly minted New Yorker. I had the privilege, as someone far too young and too naive, to be among a band of hardy pioneers developing the very first supportive housing in the country. It was 1985. I worked with some extraordinary people at Brooklyn Catholic Charities, John Tynan, Kathy Herman, and Maureen Carey. And others, Laura Jervis and Ellen Baxter, were working parallel with us on their own first projects. But the greatest privilege I had during this dawn of supportive housing was the opportunity to live with one, in one of our residences, Our Lady of Good Counsel and to share three amazing years with the residents and my neighbors there. Just in the everyday, ordinary task of life, cooking together in our common kitchen, sharing holidays, cleaning toilets, I became part and parcel of the lives of 75 other people and learned to, to value and appreciate their vulnerabilities a childhood rape, a, long, a lifelong dance with substance abuse, survival crimes that led to prison. And I came to appreciate equally the extraordinary strength, their extraordinary strength, resiliency, a strong hold on hope in the future, righteous anger, joy and humor that all emerge from these vulnerabilities in their lives. Every day there, within the walls of Our Lady of Good Counsel, it felt to me like sanctuary, a sacred and safe place that all 76 of us were fortunate to share. My life there, among my neighbors, allowed me, too, to value and appreciate my own vulnerabilities. The shame and self-loathing in having been molested as a 13-year-old boy, the self-hatred emerging in a growing awareness that I was gay, my deep, uncontrollable anger attributable to having survived, literally survived, a chaotic, alcoholic childhood. More importantly, my shared life with my neighbors allowed me to touch and to find my own strengths, 
passion and persistence in the face of an undaunting odds, an absolute uncontrollable embrace of the joy in life, especially in its simplest moments, an ability to marvel and be constantly awed, a righteous anger. I can honestly say, but for my 75 neighbors at Our Lady of Good Counsel, I would not be the person I am today, and likely I would not be standing here before you this morning. Now flash forward 30 years. Last year, I helped with the refinancing of the Catholic Charity Supportive Housing Projects. They needed freshening up at, for the next 30 years of helping and hosting residents. I was touring the building with some of our, our investors who naturally wanted to see inside at least one of the units. We knocked on a random door and an older woman appeared in the threshold as the door opened. First thing, she looked me square in the eye and she said, I know you. You used to live here long ago. I reintroduced myself and she as well. I'm Shirley Holly. We reminisced about the day that she moved in. She remembered February 26, 1986 from the Lexington Avenue shelter. She had finally beaten alcohol. She had been employed most of the time. It was never easy. She reconnected with family, both her kids and her sister. And then I asked her, how has it been living here? A broad, ecstatic smile grew on her face. And she simply said, I love it. At that moment, as Miss Holly finished her proclamation, I knew I had come home to a place full of welcome, to a sacred and safe place, and I was home. Together, all together, we do change lives, our own and the lives of those we are privileged to encounter. And together, we can change the world for better. We are changing the world for the better, creating opportunity, building equality, and making justice for all. We will succeed because we are willing to touch our own vulnerabilities and our own hurt. Then to connect with the vulnerabilities and hurt of our neighbors and together find common strength and power. Thank you. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our most excellent executive director, Laura Mashu, making her debut appearance right here, right here on this stage. <laughs> Laura just started six months ago, but boy, or should I say girl, uh, she hit the ground running and hasn't slowed down yet. Laura. You know, I keep having to follow Bill, <laughs> which is a, a very tall order. Um, good morning. What an amazing room we have before us. It is packed. We are so, so happy to see so many of you here today. Welcome to our 15th annual New York State Supportive Housing Conference. Um, being part of the process this year, I can now have a brand new appreciation for what it takes to get all of you here to organize a, a morning and to have 23 workshops. And although probably not a lot of the staff are in the room, I'd just like to take a moment to thank them for all of their work. <clears throat> Thank you to our many volunteers, panelists, and moderators. Uh, we so appreciate your time. We would not be able to do this without you. And to our sponsors and exhibitors, thank you for your support. Um, please take the time to go into our exhibition area and see all that is there. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the board of directors. Um, I have relied on you heavily. I greatly appreciate your support. They're always available for the work in the network. Thank you. Um, and to Bill, our board chair, um, as you can tell from his welcoming remarks, he has a deep-rooted uh, history 
in the supportive housing community. And really his dedication to the most vulnerable New Yorkers is so inspiring. Thank you, Bill, for all that you do. I would like to also thank our many state and city partners or who are in the room with us today. The network just has an amazing relationship with you and we, we so appreciate your work and your willingness to work with us and with the community, so thank you. And of course to our providers, to whom we would not be here today without you for all of your work and continued dedication, thank you. I'm so very honored to be part of the network and this community and very excited to say today that we have reached the mark of 50,000 units of supportive housing throughout New York State. This year alone, we've opened up 25 residences, close to 1,600 units, and each one is more beautiful than the next. Um, and it really is through your hard work and dedication that we are where we are in really helping to solve the homeless crisis. During my first six months, um, I have seen many rocks in the road, but I'm continually inspired by all of the hard work, collaboration, the conversations, the creative solutions that you put forth every day to get the, our work done, really with the well-being of the tenant first and foremost in your minds. We have much to be proud of. We are coming to the end of a very successful New York, New York 3. Uh, we have 75 units left to uh, be awarded. That's incredible. Um, particular thanks go to the city and New York State for their continued commitment to get that done, and of course to the providers. New York City has surpassed their supportive housing production targets. New York State is continuing to add additional funding into supportive housing for both capital services and operating through HCR, HHAP, and the Medicaid redesign funding. This is developing housing from Buffalo to Brooklyn, so we're extremely excited and grateful for the resources. Of course, we're always in a challenging environment fiscally. Um, we're in a very strict budget climate, so life is not easy, but we, we continue on. Um, we are facing record levels of homelessness throughout the state, and the governor and the legislature has, have seeded a new supportive housing program for $75 million. But we need a robust, long-term commitment to really meet the crushing need of the homeless, to really create the housing stock uh, that is needed to really be the answer to the problem. The campaign for New York, New York housing with over 200 signatories is moving forward. We are expanding statewide, and we will be in touch with how we can continue to really advocate for a robust supportive housing program. A good friend recently said that there are many policy issues to which we do not have the answer, but we clearly have the answer when it comes to chronic homelessness, and that is supportive housing. It's right before us, so let's continue to do the most successful, cost-effective, and humane solution available. We are also looking at a myriad of healthcare changes, um, both providing opportunities while we continue to um, keep our eye on the model to make sure it, is, it continues to be as effective as it is. And many of you have joined in that conversation. We are continuing to talk and look forward to uh, working on that with you. <clears throat> the network's mission is to bring our members together to create the space for discussion, educating and convening. We are always looking to grow our members' involvement and really appreciate hearing from you and having you come and talk with us about what your challenges are and where your successes lie. The conference today is designed to really reinvigorate that conversation we are 1,500 strong today. It's amazing. <laughs> to really continue the discussion um, on a policy level, to look at new programming, new development models. There's just such a great, great program before us. A stable, beautiful place to live gives individuals and opportunities, uh, gives individuals the opportunity to decide on life's next steps. 
Mr. Rogers, the, child, the children's television host, actually kept a quote from a social worker in his wallet. Frankly, there isn't anyone you couldn't learn to love once you heard their story. What you do every day allows people to reflect on their story and start their next chapter, to conceptualize their dreams. Every organization and every project tells a story. I recently met a formerly homeless veteran who was living in his car, and when he became suicidal, checked himself to, took himself to the ER, where the first question he was asked is whether he wanted to sign a do not resuscitate order. Now, through that very difficult journey, he has landed in supportive housing, where he is safe, where he is stable, where he is looking for a job, and exercising daily. He, uh, he told us this story while he was on a treadmill jogging. <laughs> Something I could never do, <laughs> talking and jogging at the same time. But it just goes to show, this is just one story. All of us in the room have so many stories of people's lives that have really been transformed through supportive housing and the work that you do. And I was privileged to hear his. We have an inspiring morning in front of us. We are going to be welcoming Commissioner Sutton and Dave Isay, who will share their work and their stories. And I hope you will find the conference both informative and inspiring. Please join us at the end of the day for the cocktail party and some more networking. And on behalf of the network, I want to thank you for your commitment and dedication in improving the lives of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you. So it is my privilege to introduce Commissioner Sutton. The energy and the passion that Commissioner Sutton brings to the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs to ensure that not a single chronically homeless veteran is either in the shelter or on the streets is incredibly inspiring. But this is coupled with the fact that she is a retired Army Brigadier General. <laughs> So her precision, her dedication, her leadership has catapulted the New York City Veterans Task Force and really is getting us to the goal of ending chronic veterans homelessness by 2015. Additionally, she is working with the First Lady on the mental health roadmap, which is wonderful. We're so excited that the de Blasio administration has taken this on. So please join me in a warm welcome, Commissioner Sutton. Thank you so much, Laura. It really is just such a privilege to be here this morning. And Bill, thank you so much for your inspiring story and the rest of the board members and everyone who's here really today dedicated to this very noble purpose, housing those who are most in need. You know, my, my journey, I, I loved uh, your, your story there, Laura, from uh, you know, Mr. Rogers and the neighborhood and how you know, it, there is a really a deep, heartfelt nugget of wisdom there that once we know each other's story, what follows then? It's, it's, it's the bonds of love that unite us as part of, you know, the, the human family. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll share a little bit of my story. And, and I thought to myself, well, you know, when did I start this journey of becoming a a, a, a veteran now and, and having this privilege to serve in the greatest city on earth uh, as your commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs. Well, you know, in 1982, I was at Fort Sam Houston, Texas in basic training, boot camp. And at four o'clock in the morning, I was awoken, I mean, bolt right out of my rack. And I heard this amazing chorus. These were army medics who were running in formation, probably 350, 400 of them. And the Jody call that they were belting out went like this. We like it here. We love it here. We've finally found a home. A home, 
a home. We've finally found a home. And those words just really sunk deep in my heart. There were all kinds of other Jody calls that I heard during those months of boot camp and basic training. But the one that our medics, our recruits, just connected with, with the most passion, with the most heartfelt emphasis, was this one about finding a home. Well, you know, years later, after 30 years of being privileged to serve with the finest soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coasties that the earth has ever known, um, you know, I found my way to, to New York City, and I feel like, as my partner Lori and I two years ago just decided, uh, let's just move to Brooklyn for three years as a grand adventure. Let's just figure out, you know, what's next. Didn't even know about this position as commissioner. I mean, it's a wild journey, a wild story that uh, has led me to now come full circle and feel like, yes, I like it here. I love it here. I've finally found a home. And what a home this city is. To have the privilege of working for a mayor and administration and a city with this long history of commitment to those who are most vulnerable, the right to shelter, this commitment to ending veteran homelessness, this was the privilege that was mine to walk into last September. And let me just tell you a little bit about that story. You know, I started out really with a, a, a broad scale, full court press assessment, a listening tour in all five boroughs. And the most important part of my initial education, starting last fall, was in looking for men and women with cardboard signs, often sitting on the sidewalk, and asking for help. And so I've spoken with about probably between 50 and 60 now, and every time I get a chance, I, I add to my, my learning. I consider them my tutors, my mentors. Some of them are veterans. Many of them are not. All of them are human beings. And so it's, it's inspired me to dig even deeper to figure out how can we make the most of this moment in history. A history that builds on the work of the task force. I was privileged to, to, to be asked to join the Veterans Task Force, which was formed out of the continuum of care, uh, the larger group here working with homelessness in New York City. And this task force, I mean, this is really, these are historic times, this is not business as usual. This task force is co-chaired by Julie Irwin of the VA with Allison Zickman, DHS, now with HPD. It has members of all of the usual city agencies, HRA, NYCHA, HPD, now MOVA, as well as all of our not-for-profit service provider, SSVF partners. And as we've traversed this journey, you know, New York City was so privileged to be recognized with New Orleans as one of two cities that have made the most progress over the last several years, 70% reduction, and, you know, we're, we're after it. We know that it's not enough, though, to make it to the end of this year and declare victory without creating the system that makes this sustainable. And so that's what we're after right now. We're working like fury, and I'm looking at Nicole Branca right now, who's been one of my mentors and guides. George, George Nashak uh, is out there someplace, and Donna, thank you so much for everything that you and your team are doing. As I'm looking around, we are family. We are all in this together. And so together we are. Today, as I look at the the lineup of workshops, the depth, the breadth, the scope, the scale of learning, of sharing that's going on across this room and that will emanate throughout our state and throughout our country, it makes me very, very proud. Very proud 
to live in a country that has made this goal of ending veteran homelessness, not just minimizing it, just, not just reducing it, but ending it, a national goal. And of course, what we learn in this journey of ending veteran homelessness, we can then scope and scale and apply to the larger issues, certainly here in New York City as well as around the country, of helping those who are really the most vulnerable among us. And that's where I come back, Bill, to some of your first words. Wasn't that a great title? Our Lady of Good Counsel? I aspire to be a Lady of Good Counsel. And I will tell you, when I had the chance to early on make a tour of some of the, the developments in Brooklyn with Monsignor Lopinto and his team, I was drawn again to this notion of home and family and community. As one of the women at the, one of the developments we went to knocked on the door, she came out and of course she knew Monsignor Lopinto and she said, welcome home, Monsignor. We're a family here. And indeed, we're the human family. Thank you so much for welcoming me into your midst, for allowing me to share my enthusiasm, my passion. I look forward to learning from each of you. And let's just, um, let's just rededicate our efforts today. As someone has said, let's be kinder than necessary, for everyone is fighting some kind of battle. I know I am, you are, all of us are here. And together, we are stronger than any of us can ever be separate. So thank you so much. God bless. Amazing. Thank you so much, Commissioner Sutton. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome David I say. Um, from StoryCorps here today. Um, Dave recently in his TED Talk reflected about the emotions people feel uh, when they hear a story. Uh, and many of us are bringing out the tissues on Friday morning if you're listening to StoryCorps on NPR. And he reflected, when we hear something authentic and pure, lives live with kindness, courage, decency, and integrity. When you have that kind of story, it can sometimes feel like you're on holy ground. Dave has dedicated his life to helping us tell our stories, honoring the people least heard in our society. And we would like to thank him for that honor. It is with great pleasure and admiration today that we welcome Dave, uh, Dave I say, to the Supportive Housing Conference. Please join me in welcoming him. Good morning, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all. Um, listening to uh, Bill, I was thinking about all of the synergies between StoryCorps and, and the work you do, and I just feel so privileged and honored to be here. Uh, as Commissioner Sutton said, this is family, and it feels like family for, for StoryCorps as well. Um, and I hope uh, when I play some stories today, you guys will end up agreeing with that. So let, let me just start by asking, who, who here, has anybody here participated in StoryCorps? Few, okay, and, and who here had knows StoryCorps from the radio, has heard of StoryCorps? Okay, and who here has never heard of StoryCorps and has no idea what I'm doing up here? Wow, a lot of people. <laughs> okay, well, so I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you a very brief uh, history of StoryCorps, but I, I'll start a little earlier than that because I feel like there's, um, there's, there's just so many connections between StoryCorps and, and the supportive housing community. I used to be a, a public radio documentary maker before starting StoryCorps a dozen years ago. And one of the, one of the um, kind of uh, aha moments that led to the creation of StoryCorps happened when I did a documentary uh, down at the Sunshine Hotel on the Bowery, um, one of the last flop houses down there. And uh, I did a radio documentary and then I did a book of, of oral histories and photographs of the men who lived at the Sunshine 
and a couple of other hotels. The Sunshine, I, I think, is not there. It's not, I think there may be three or four guys left in there. Uh, and I, I remember when um, we, we, we did a book of these, these photographs, and I went back with the galley, which is an early version of the book, into one of the hotels, probably the Sunshine. And I, um, and I was showing it to different people in the book, and I showed it to one of the men in the book who grabbed the book out of my hand, and he looked at his photograph and his oral history. And you know, if you put up that slide, Andrew, as you probably know, there are the long hallways in the, in the, in the, um, in the flop houses, the old flop houses. And this man looked at his photograph and his oral history, and he, he sat there for 30 seconds just staring at it. And then he grabbed the book out of my hand, and he started running down the long hallway in that flop house, holding the book over his head, shouting, I exist, I exist. And that became kind of the clarion call for StoryCorps, which started about a dozen years ago. And it's a very simple idea. We built a um, booth in Grand Central Terminal where you can come, anyone can come, with a loved one to listen to them, to honor them, or with a friend, or with a colleague, or with someone they serve. You go into this sacred space, this dark, this booth that is, the lights are low, complete silence, and you sit across from, say, your grandmother for 40 minutes. There's a facilitator who works for StoryCorps in the corner. And you listen and you talk. Many people think of it as, if I had 40 minutes left to live, what would I say to, what would I ask of this person who I'm, I'm sitting and, and speaking with? Very intense emotional interviews. At the end of the 40 minutes, you get a CD or a digital copy. Another one stays with us and it goes to the Library of Congress so your great, great, great grandkids can someday get to know your grandmother uh, through her voice and story. So it started as this kind of crazy idea. I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, uh, and, uh, and it worked in these kind of magical ways. And I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the history of StoryCorps, play you some stories, and then, um, and then play you uh, some stories that relate to the, the, the work you do and the people that you serve here. So um, the first story I'm going to play is from very, very early on in StoryCorps. And I, I think what happens in the booth when people have this experience of, of, of being listened to is that it reminds people that they matter and they won't be forgotten. And I, I know that the work that, that you all do every day has so much to do with, with listening to your, your clients. This is an interview that happened probably in the first or second week of, of StoryCorps. Um, and uh, this is a man named uh, Danny Parasa, as you see, and his wife, Annie. And Danny was an OTB clerk uh, living in Brooklyn. Annie is a nurse. And uh, they came to StoryCorps to talk about their first date which had happened 25 years before. So this is just a taste of what happens in StoryCorps, a very early interview, Danny and Annie Parasa talking about their first date. She started to talk, and I said, listen, I'm going to deliver a speech. I said, at the end, you're going to want to go home. I said, you represent a 34-letter word. I said, that word is love. I said, if we're going anywhere, we're going down the aisle because I'm too tired, too sick, and too sore to do any other damn thing. And she turned around, and she said, well, of course I'll marry you. And the next morning, I called him as early as I possibly could. And he always gets up early. <laughs> to, make, to make sure she hadn't changed her mind, and she hadn't. And uh, every year on, on April 22nd, around 3 o'clock, I call her and ask her if it was today, would she do it again? And so far, the answer's been the same. Yeah, 25 times yes. <laughs> you, you see, the thing of it is, I always feel guilty when I say I love you to you, and I say it so often, I say it to remind you that as dumpy as I am, it's coming for me. It's, it's like hearing a beautiful song from a busted old radio. And it's nice of you to keep the radio around the house. If I don't have a note on the kitchen table, I think there's something wrong. You write a love letter to me well, every the only morning. thing that could possibly be wrong is I couldn't find a silly pen. To my princess, the weather out today is extremely rainy. I'll call you at 11.20 in the morning. It's a romantic weather And report. I love you, I love you, I love you. When a guy is happily married, no matter what happens at work, no matter what happens in the rest of the day, there's a shelter when you get home. There's a knowledge, knowing that you can hug somebody without them throwing you downstairs and saying, get your hands off me. And it, it, being married is like having a color television set. You never want to go back to black and white. <laughs> So Danny, Danny and Annie, um, we, you know, we fell in love with Danny. This, he, he personifies both Danny and Annie so much of what StoryCorps is about and so much 
of what speaks to the core of the work you do, and it's the poetry and the power and the grace and the beauty in the words and the stories of people all around us when we take the time to listen. Um, this was, as I said, very early at StoryCorps. And you know, one of the secrets of StoryCorps, quietly kept secrets, is when we opened this booth where you can come and you know, honor someone and listen to them, no one actually came. Now we have like lines of like thousands of people to get in. But in the beginning, we actually had one woman who came 200 times. She brought everyone she'd ever met. She'd meet people on the subway and bring them into StoryCorps. <laughs> And, and Danny and Annie also were able to come many times, and they did. They loved StoryCorps. Danny brought every character he'd ever met, uh, major league umpires and undercover uh, drug enforcement agents. And, it, and, it, it got, and he would bring Annie back to read love letters, and it got to the point where Danny would call us on a Friday and say, you know, I'm having a cataract operation on Monday. Do you need me to come in on Wednesday and document it? And we'd say, Danny, sure, whatever you want to do. Um, a couple of years later, Danny was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and we ended up um, re, um, that week naming that original booth in Grand Central Terminal the Danny and Annie Parasa booth at a ceremony. And then the next week, uh, Danny was too sick to come to the booth, but asked if he could record a final interview with Annie. So we went to their house in Bay Ridge and, um, and, and recorded an interview with them. And this is Danny and Annie Parasa at their home in Bay Ridge. The illness is not hard on me. It's just, you know, the finality of it. And him, he goes along like a trooper. Listen, even downhill, a car doesn't roll unless it's pushed, and you're giving me a great push. The deal of it is, we try to give each other hope, and not hope that I'll live, hope that she'll do well after I pass, hope that people will support her, hope that if she meets somebody and likes him, she marries him. You know, he has everything planned, you know. I'm working on it. She said it was her call. She wants to walk out behind the casket alone. I guess that's the way to do it, because when we were married, you know how your brother takes you down, your father takes you down? She said, well, I don't know which of my brothers to walk in with. I don't want to offend anybody. I said, I got a solution. I said, you walk in with me, you walk out with me. And the other day, I said, who's going to walk down the aisle with you behind the casket? You know, to support her. And she said, nobody. I walked in with you alone. I walked out with you alone. <laughs> There's a thing in life where you have to come to terms with dying. Well, I haven't come to terms with dying yet. I want to come to terms with being sure that you understand that my love for you up to this point was as much as it could be and will be as much as it could be for eternity. I always said the only thing I have to give you is a poor gift and it's myself. And I always gave it. And if there's a way to come back and give it, I'll do that too. Do you have the Valentine's Day letter there? Yeah. My dearest wife, this is a very special day it is a day on which we share our love, which still grows after all these years. Now that love is being used by us to sustain us through these hard times. All my love, all my days, and more. Happy Valentine's Day. I could write on and on about her. She lights up the room in the morning when she tells me to put both hands on her shoulders so she can support me. She lights up my life when she says to me at night, wouldn't you like a little ice cream? Or would you please drink more water? I mean, those aren't very romantic things to say, but they stir my heart. In my mind, in my heart, there has never been, there is not now, and never will be another any. So we recorded that interview on a, on a Thursday, and uh, Danny, uh, we broadcast on NPR the next Friday, and Danny died about two hours after the broadcast. We received thousands and thousands and thousands of letters and emails of condolence, and um, uh, gave them to Annie, and she actually buried a copy with Danny, because he, he was a guy who, um, a, as you can see, you know, he was, he was five feet tall, he had crossed eyes, he had one snaggle tooth, 
And the guy had more romance in his little pinky than everyone in Hollywood, all those leading men in Hollywood put together. But he was also someone who had been teased uh, and you know, people would make fun of him uh, uh, and, and he never felt that he had a voice. And he buried a copy of those letters with him and, um, and she also kept a copy and still to this day, many, many years later, reads a copy of a letter she received from a public radio listener instead of the letter she would have gotten from Danny. So that's kind of the beginning of, of StoryCorps. Uh, and, and over the last 11 years, it's grown enormously. We've now done about 60,000 interviews, 65,000 interviews all across the country. It's the largest collection of human voices um, ever gathered. We, um, we, we are, we're very much a, uh, we, we are, we're a, a social justice organization. Half of our slots are held for people who know us through NPR. The other half, we work with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of community organizations across the country each year, including uh, organizations that some folks in this, in this room work for or run, um, to make sure that their clients, the people that they serve, have the opportunity to be listened to in this way at StoryCorps. So like supportive housing, a very simple, um, uh, beautiful idea that works. And I, I just want to take a moment um, to thank someone who is more responsible than anyone else, including uh, myself, for the organization that uh, StoryCorps is today, and she's one of you. Um, Donna Galeno ran homeless services for the Red Cross for 20 years um, and lives and breathes the ethos of supportive housing. Uh, I had the idea for StoryCorps, but Donna built the organization that StoryCorps is uh, today from the ground up with precision and fidelity and fierceness and a huge heart and runs it like a military operation for good. Um, so I feel blessed to be working with her and I just wanted to thank Donna Galeno who runs program for StoryCorps. Would you stand, Donna? She won't stand. Uh, there, I, I'm going to play a story uh, that relates to another person who came out of the supporting housing uh, world. Uh, uh, Melvin Reeves, who um, focused for decade, uh, decades was delivering services to homeless mothers and their children uh, here in, in New York City, um, what has been at StoryCorps for about a decade. And his first job at StoryCorps was creating an initiative called GRIO. So StoryCorps launched about 10 big national initiatives over the years. Um, honoring and focusing on individual groups of, of folks who we feel um, their voices should be raised. So our first was with 9-11 families. Everyone who lost a loved one on September 11th comes to StoryCorps to leave a record of that person's life. And GRIO, which is now the largest collection of African-American voices ever gathered, um, uh, is uh, it's a West African word for storyteller and um, honors the stories of African-American families across the country. So I'm going to play one GRIO story. Um, and, and this is from the first month after we launched down at the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta. Um, I, Melvin and I had the honor of going down to the King Center after that first month and playing stories and, and listening to the folks who had participated. And one of the people who was in the audience that night um, was Lynn Weaver, who had done one of the first Grio interviews with his daughter Kimberly. Um, she had interviewed him and he talked about his father, whose name was Ted Weaver. Ted Weaver was a janitor and a chauffeur in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, Lynn came to remember him. My father was everything to me. And it's actually kind of difficult talking about him without becoming very emotional. Up until, you know, he died. Every decision I made, I'd always call him. And he would never tell me what to do, but he would always listen and say, well, what do you want to do? And he made me feel that I could do anything that I wanted to do. I can remember when we integrated the schools that there were many times when I was just scared, and uh, I, I didn't think that uh, I would survive. And I'd look up and he'd be there. And whenever I saw him, I knew that I was safe. You know, I always tell you that your, your mama is the smartest person I've ever met. But I think my father ranks right up there as, as brilliant. When I was in high school, I was taking algebra, and I was sitting at the kitchen table trying to do my homework. And I got frustrated and said, I just can't figure this out. I'm just, so my father said, what's the problem? He came by, he said, what's the problem? And I said, that's this algebra. And he said, well, let me look at it. I said, dad, they didn't even have algebra in your day. <laughs> and I went to sleep. And around four o'clock that morning, he woke me up. He said, come on, son, get up. 
he set me at the kitchen table and he taught me algebra. What he had done is set up all night and read the algebra book. And then he explained the problems to me so I could do them and understand them. <laughs> and to this day, I live my life trying to be half the man my father was, just half the man. And uh, I would be a success if my children loved me half as much as I love my father. The day after that event, um, Melvin and I received an email that says, you'll never know how honored and touched I was by the playing of the remembrance of my dad. After I got home, I realized that the evening of the Griot reception was the anniversary of my father's death. Even in death, he continues to touch me with his love. This project has touched me more than you'll ever know. Signed, Lynn Weaver, Chairman of Surgery, Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. So that was another kind of important moment for us, thinking about Ted Weaver, as uh, the, the janitor and chauffeur in Knoxville, who was the smartest and greatest man that his son Lynn had ever met, um, who had sacrificed so much, uh, and to me is the great American hero, the kind of person we should be holding up to our kids as examples of who they can and should grow up to be, the kind of person we should be building statues to and, and, and honoring and thanking for their intelligence and wisdom and courage. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of the folks who, who you serve as well. Uh, I'm going to play some, some stories that have to do with the populations of folks um, that, that you're involved with and then um, answer some questions if you have any questions. Um, so I picked, I picked a few stories uh, that, that kind of resonated with, with the work of, of supporting, uh, supportive housing. And, and the first one I'm going to play speaks to kind of this, ah, I'm not going to play that one. I get to choose whatever I want. I'm up here. This is, this is one I've never played before publicly. Um, and I heard it a, a week ago on our podcast, and uh, I thought I'd, I'd bring it to you. Um, uh, this, is, this is a story that takes place out of Texas. And um, uh, it's, it's a young man, as you see, Darius Clark Monroe. Um, when he was in high school in, uh, in Texas, in a small town in Texas, uh, he was an honor student who had never been in trouble. Um, but uh, after his 16th birthday, he robbed a bank in this town, Stafford, Texas. Um, it was an armed robbery uh, at gunpoint with his friends. Um, decades later, he sat down with one of the victims of that crime. Uh, David Ned, who's a pastor, was, uh, was a customer in the bank. Uh, and they came together uh, to talk about that incident that happened a couple of de decades ago. So this is Darius Clark Monroe and David Ned. How did you get to that point where you said, I'm going to rob a bank? What was happening at my house was that things weren't going well in terms of the finances. My parents were working all the time. And once they told me that we were in like $25,000, $30,000 of debt, I was thinking, how am I going to help? Because nobody else is going to come save the day. And so one day on TV, there was this guy who had robbed this bank. And I was struck by how easy it seemed. Did you really think you were going to get away with this? I literally thought no one would ever find out. It took almost four weeks before I was arrested and then sent to prison. How many years did it was given you? Five. Five years. Mm -hmm. When I got out, I wanted to apologize to the people who were inside the bank. And when I spoke to you, it was the first time I got to truly understand the seriousness of what I did. When you came into the bank, you made us all lay on the floor. Can you imagine laying on the floor and all you hear is that shotgun, clack, clack. Everything in me was shaking. And I kept saying to myself, it's over. I used to think I wasn't scared of nothing. They used to call me Brave Dave. I figured if anybody tried to rob me, I said, well, they're going to take my life to get my money. I don't work too hard for it. Mm -hmm. So that was hard for me because I had to come to grips with that. And one thing that helped me when you came by and asked me to forgive you, Years later, I thought about my son. He could have been put in jail because he's been through some stuff, but should he ever turn his life around, I would like that somebody he may have taken advantage of would give him a second chance. It has been incredible once we be given a second, third, fourth shot and having you be a part. This has given me hope. I'm really proud of you and uh, I don't know if you've got a good relationship with your dad, but 
If you don't, he's the one that missed out on a great son. And I'm here to do whatever it is I need to do 17 years later to help you be a great young man. Let's go to North Carolina. Oh. I, what I hope happens is that every week when we play these stories on NPR, um, and we also have um, animations that you can find on the web, that we just kind of shake people on the shoulder and remind them, you know, this is what's important. This is what's important. Because there is kind of so much white noise and nonsense, and in the media, just absolute bullshit that we're uh, surrounded with. And sometimes it's hard to tell what's real and what's an advertisement. And I think the power of a story authentically told, you know, this is kind of the opposite of reality TV. Nobody comes to get rich. Nobody comes to get famous. It's an act of generosity and love. And it also, I mean, if StoryCorps has changed me over these last 12 years, it's made me much more hopeful. Um, and uh, I, I feel like that, that hope that, that um, rings through these voices and stories is what you do and the gift that you give to people every single day. Um, this is uh, Willie Davis and Yalitza Castro. Um, Yalitza is an undocumented housekeeper, worker in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and at StoryCorps, she remembered a cold night when she was driving with her kids and saw a homeless man with a sign asking for help. Her daughter asked why they weren't taking him to dinner, and she turned around the car to find him, but he was gone. Um, at that moment, she decided that she was going to start cooking meals for homeless men. And she's been doing that every other Saturday, starting uh, in, on Christmas a few years ago. So here's an excerpt of a conversation she had with one of the men uh, who's eaten many of those meals, Willie Davis. Willie, do you remember the first dinner together? Yes, I do. Church van came, picked some of us guys up from the men's shelter. And I'm like, why is this lady coming to the roughest place in Charlotte to do this for us. So I must be fishy about this, but I said, I'm gonna go. And when I got out of the van, I smelled the cooking, and then I saw you. I saw a smile on your face. It made everybody feel welcome and comfortable. And when you cooked, it was like what my mom used to cook. You know, I haven't had that kind of feeling in a long time, and I really needed that. That night, I finished all the stuff in the kitchen, and when I got to the buffet tables, you guys all together start singing the Feliz Navidad song, and I start crying. Everybody just gave you a standing ovation pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you don't make us feel homeless. You know us by names and faces, and we know y'all care. Before I met you, at least I pretty much almost gave up. But that home-cooked meal, it just brought my self-esteem back up. Now I've got my own place and... It's really amazing. And that gives me motivation because I'm here in the United States by myself with my kids. And I know that it's hard. That dinner is not just a meal. It's try to make your guys feel like we are family. Every other Saturday feel like Christmas to me. That's why I keep coming. I'm always going to keep coming. I have a lot of stories. I could keep here all day. Seriously, I'm like thinking, what, what am I going to play? You know, and it's because so many of the stories we do relate to the work that you do. But, I mean, almost every one. Um, I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll play a few more. Well, let me see. Okay. So let's do, um, uh, this, this is a story that, um, that I've also never played before. And this takes place in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. Um, and this is uh, Bonnie Brown, who came to StoryCorps with her teenage daughter, uh, Myra. Um, to talk about um, Bonnie as, as a mom. When you found out you were pregnant with me, like, what did you think? I was very happy and I was also scared. Why were you scared? Because I had never been pregnant before. I never had really an idea of how to care for a baby. Did you ever feel like I was too much to handle, like ever? No. I think because I'm different, it might seem hard for me. But I was going to give it all I got, no matter what. When I was a kid, I didn't realize that you were different. And you actually had to tell me, because I wasn't figuring it out. I said to you, I said, Myra, I know I'm not like your friend's mother's, but I'm doing the best I can. And you said, it's OK, Mommy. And 
that made me feel so good. Has my disability affected your life? I guess, like when I was little, you had to go in for my parent-teacher conference, and like as a disclosure, I was like, my mom's disabled, but the day after the interview, my teacher said that you seemed really intelligent, and that made me feel embarrassed. <laughs> Why? Because I kind of felt bad that I had said that, and then you'd gone and you'd been fine. No offense taken, you were just giving our heads up, right? Yeah. What's the hardest thing that you've overcome? Being hurt from people. Not physical, but just like, like emotionally? Yeah, yeah. There were times when we would go out and people would just blatantly stare and I would say something. I guess I'm kind of protective. I'm really thankful because you understand me and you love me and you accept me and thank you for that. I don't know, you kind of make it seem like I tolerate you. I love you. You're a good parent. And just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you do anything less for me. You want me to succeed. Yes, I do. I want you to make something of yourself. I want you to know that even though our situation is unique, I'm happy that I'm in it because I'm happy that I'm with you. Thank you, Mara. And I feel the same way. I will never change it for anything in this world. I'm going to play a story from, we, so we've done a bunch of special initiatives. I'll play this story and then we can, um, we can, we can talk for a few minutes. This is, um, we've done, uh, we, 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 our most recent special initiative is called the Military Voices Initiative. Um, and uh, and uh, since uh, Commissioner Sutton's here, I thought I'd play uh, at least one, or one story from, from this initiative. This is focusing on post 9-11. Uh, veterans and their families, and we've done um, thousands of interviews across the country with them. Um, and uh, this is a broadcast from just a week or two ago. Um, I'm going to do this one. This is uh, Scott uh, Skiles and his son, Zach. Uh, Marine Corporal Skiles uh, served in Iraq. Uh, when he came back home, he couldn't uh, hold the job, and he ended up homeless. Um, so Zach and his son, uh, Scott, who had never sat down to talk about that experience, uh, came to StoryCorps uh, a month or two ago um, to talk about that experience and remember um, when, uh, when they said goodbye to each other uh, at Zach's base before he deployed overseas. I remember saying to you, every gift that I've been given, I don't have a better one than to be your dad. And I remember you smiling, saying, I love you too, Dad. And then you got out of the car and went to war. So what was life like after you came home? I was pretty sure someone was going to kick down my door, and I was scared to go to sleep. I couldn't sustain employment. I couldn't pay rent and pay for groceries. It all just kind of fell apart, and then I was homeless. The crazy thing was that I didn't think that there was anything super wrong. You know, the nighttime, I stayed on coastal trails and hiking trails, and in the daytime, I could just pass out at a park. There was a time period where I didn't know where you were, mm -hmm. and it is difficult to watch anyone let go of hope. But when it's your son, it's excruciating. I remember great relief that you decided to go into inpatient treatment. And I remember one night you getting out of the car to walk back into the treatment building. It was dark and your head was kind of down. And for a moment, I could feel the weight you were carrying. As I watched you walk into that building, I uttered these two words that I don't know if they were some kind of prayer or not, but they just came out, my son. And I was absolutely overcome with grief and love and the beginning of hope. What is life like for you now? It's pretty cool. <laughs> you graduated undergrad? Yes. I heard summa cum laude. <laughs> I, I'm just asking. That's what I heard. Yeah. I remember my dad saying this to me, and I feel it is so true between you and I. It is your life, so you have the last word. But then as your dad, that gives me the second to the last word. 
And the second to the last word is, I believe in you and I'm on your side. I think that if you were going to sum up um, what StoryCorps is all about, these stories we share, the interviews that happens in the booth, um, if, if you're going to do that in one line, it's that every life matters and every life matters equally and infinitely. And uh, that is the work that you do every day. Um, a couple questions. Any questions? And if no questions, I can do stories. Usually I just stand here and wait for questions, but I can just play <laughs> stories instead. Anything? Uh, yes. So the question is, how long is the session and do we edit it down? So each of these 60,000 sessions we've done is 40 minutes. And we look at, um, at those uh, 40 minutes in each of those 60,000 sessions is equally valuable and important, sometimes a sacred moment in, in people's lives. Um, and we call that access to the StoryCorps experience. The content that we play, the three minutes we play, uh, it's three minutes edited out of about three or 400 40-minute interviews, so the ratio is really tiny. And these are stories that have this kind of universal quality that almost demand that they be played. Again, no better, no worse than any other interview. But, but um, hopefully what, what, what these, we, we hope happens when you hear these on Friday on NPR is that you're gonna be, you know, radio, audio, the voice is so intimate. It's like the soul is contained in the human voice. And we hope that, and you'll kind of walk in the footsteps of someone who you might have thought was a little bit different than you. And most people still listen to radio in the car with headphones and it's almost like um, whoever it is um, uh, 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 of any of these interviews is almost whispering in your ear. And we hope that just for a moment you recognize a little bit of yourself in that person and uh, that a, a bridge is built of understanding and of listening and, and of compassion. And that's what we're trying to do with StoryCorps. You know, I think we're at the very beginning of a long road and the dream with StoryCorps is that someday we'll touch the lives of every American family and that we'll move the needle in this country just a little bit on helping us become more compassionate, listening better, uh, and recognizing the dignity and, and humanity in, in every life. Another question? Yes, sir. So the question was, what, what other uses do we have for these sessions? So we have, um, as I said, we have animations, we have books, we have radio broadcasts. Um, and I, and, and um, since you asked, I'll play one very quick um, interview from another program that we're developing called StoryCorps U. And StoryCorps U is a positive youth development uh, curriculum. It's a year-long curriculum for 10th and 11th graders that um, where, where um, kids in very high-need schools are played um, stories, um, presented stories that speak to them and learn the story core interview technique to help them recognize the power of their own voice and to feel a connection to teachers um, and to feel that the teachers understand them and to help teachers understand them. And I'll play a very quick clip of Celeste Davis Carr. Um, she, um, she is a teacher. Um, at a high need school in Chicago. And in one of her class assignments, her student, uh, Aaron, whose ne last name we're not gonna use, uh, revealed that he'd been homeless for the past several months in his recording. Um, his teacher had no idea. Um, and a year later, she came back with Aaron to StoryCorps um, to talk about um, the revelation uh, and, um, and how that affected their relationship. When you shared your StoryCorps recording with everyone, how did you feel, Aaron? I felt like a big load was let off. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I just said it. I don't know what made me say it, but I'm like, let me just be honest and just get it out. I was scared because I felt helpless. I didn't know what to do. But at the same time, I felt I had an obligation to try my best to help you. Yeah, I didn't even know you actually listened to that one. I you listened know. to all of them, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really think that I would ever tell a teacher, but it makes me know that you're special because you care. Because mm -hmm. sometimes kids were bullying me, throwing chairs, throwing glass and stuff at me. So overall, how do you feel? You have more friends this year? Yes, I have more friends this year. So it's better than last year? Yeah. I'm in the foster home now, been since October. Do you feel different living in a foster home? It's good, actually. I feel comfortable. 
where I am now, it kind of feels like home. So can I tell you one thing that I really admire about you, Aaron? Because I've never told you. Do you know that, how strong you are? <laughs> no. You never realized that. No. But you have a strength that no matter what anyone says about you or they do to you, you don't change who you are as a person. And a lot of people don't have that strength. So I admire that about you. Thank you. Don't make me cry again. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see you happy. Just your smile is the best moments of you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Maybe one more question? Um, yes. I'm sorry not that I don't see anybody in the back. I usually like to pick people. But yes, front. How can you use the power of for Oh, what a great question. So how can we use the power of StoryCorps to advocate and to raise up the voices of the people that you serve? So we've had a very exciting um, eight weeks in, uh, at StoryCorps. Um, uh, we uh, launched an app about eight weeks ago uh, that uh, has really changed the face of, 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 of StoryCorps. Uh, uh, as as um, Laura mentioned I gave a TED talk um, and we won something called the TED Prize where they uh, gave us the funding to create this. So now everybody can, on their cell phones, can download the StoryCorps app and, um, and it's kind of a digital facilitator. Again, the facilitators who work for StoryCorps are these people who work for us for a year or two. It's a pretty high burnout job. It's very intense, not so different than, than, than the jobs that you all do, bearing witness to these interviews and collecting the wisdom of humanity. And what we created eight weeks ago was a digital facilitator um, where basically it walks you through the StoryCorps interview process. On your cell phone, you can do a StoryCorps interview when you're done with it, one tap and it uploads to the Library of Congress. So that means that we can achieve scale in a way that we never did before. One of the things we're going to do, for instance, is over Thanksgiving break, we're going to ask every U.S. history teacher in the country to assign to their um, students to record a grandparent or another elder. Um, so that, uh, in theory, we could record a whole generation and honor a whole generation of Americans over one single weekend. Um, I said in my, in my TED talk that, uh, and it, it, is the, it was the most important line for me in that talk, where I said that uh, the dream with this app is that someday we can all go into hospitals and to um, senior centers and uh, to homeless shelters and maybe even to prisons and to raise the voices and honor the voices of those who feel least heard uh, and who most need to be heard. And that is my dream with this app and our dream with StoryCorps, to honor those voices, to raise those voices, to help folks recognize how much their lives matter, that truth of how much their lives matter. So we have a session um, at 1.45. Uh, Dina Zemsky, who's here and works with us, will be I'm doing a session to show you how to use the app in your work. So I hope that everyone will join us at that session. Um, uh, any, uh, I'm going to play one more story. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play this because it was just requested of me. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with, um, with uh, the work you do other than it's about humanity. Uh, and this is just a... Um, this is just a, one of the animated story core stories we've done. These are two cousins in Florida um, uh, uh, talking to each other about a formative figure from their life, and, uh, and uh, enjoy. Let's talk about Mr. Vine. Lizzie Devine. Ms. Devine was a wiry lady. She wore summer dresses. She had a bandana and a straw hat. And she was the only person I knew that had more power than my grandmother. She wasn't a mean person. She was stern. Stern, yes, very and you stern. You know, when she said something, she meant exactly what she said. Right. In fact, she was our Sunday school teacher. The only thing that would keep you from going to Sunday school 
You had to have one foot on a banana peel and the other in the grave. Absolutely. That's the only There's thing. There's no, no excuse. You had to go. had to go. One of the things that you prayed for when you were in the divine's class was, Lord, please let me get old enough to get out of this class. <laughs> she did the catechism. Who made you? God. Where is God? Everywhere. <laughs> she went through and you said, oh, Lord, have mercy, please. <laughs> this Miss Divine would come in on Sunday mornings to take us to Sunday school. And, and, and when I saw her come, Sherry, I thought the leaves would be blowing up the trees and the sky would go black and the clouds would come in. And she'd come in the house one morning and say, good morning, children. And everybody, my mother on down, said, good morning, Miss Divine. And she says, it's time to go to Sunday school this morning, children. I said, Miss Divine, I can't go to Sunday school today. Uh, she said, no. I said, no, ma'am. She says, why not? She said, because I, I said, my mother didn't bring enough clothes for me to go to Sunday school this, this morning. She said, oh, no. I said, no, ma'am. She said, well, what do you have? What kind of clothes do you have? I said, all I have, Miss Divine, are my pajamas and my tennis shoes. She said, well, that's okay, honey. Put your tennis shoes on. We go to Sunday school. I looked at my mother, and she looked away, Sharon. <laughs> Miss Divine made me walk two blocks in my pajamas and my tennis shoes. I had to sit in church with my friends. Do a Sunday school my pajamas and my tennis shoes. I'm gonna tell you, Sherry, I'll, I'll never lie to get it. <laughs> divine was always there to take care of us. Right. But when Miss Divine braided your hair, your eyes went up like this. <laughs> you had to sleep on soft pillows because I mean, boy, she had it tight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Miss Divine had mango trees all over her yard. But Ms. Divine never brought you a mango until it was rotten. <laughs> it would be, it would smell like liquor. <laughs> That's when she brought you a mango. <laughs> but you know what? That's the kind of stuff that we got growing up. And, and, and I'll never forget that. Laura mentioned that quote um, uh, that Mr. Rogers used to carry around in his pocket, um, which is a beautiful quote, which goes something like, uh, it's impossible not to love someone whose story you've heard. You all in this room have heard a lot of stories, and you've got a lot of love in your hearts. And we as a city and as a country and as human beings love you for the work that you do every day. Keep on. Never give up. I know that this kind of work, someone once described StoryCorps as um, hard work and blood work and love work. And sometimes I know it can feel a little bit hopeless, but you just got to pick yourself up <laughs> and go in the next day and, and do it again because the work that you're doing is, is so important. And you do remind us all that every life matters. Um, and you change people's lives and you give us hope. You give me hope. Of all the, I've done many, many speeches uh, in my life and I can't think of one where I felt more privileged to be in front of a group. Um, thank you so much. Keep up the great work. Keep listening. Keep loving. Thank you. So incredibly powerful, right? Um, what an amazing, amazing experience that you've shared with us, Dave. And um, we're, we're going to be working with StoryCorps and um, in the supportive housing community and maybe having a supportive housing StoryCorps day. So stay tuned for that. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you, Commissioner Sutton. We have a great day ahead of us. Uh, it's almost exactly 10.30, we're right on time, so please hustle off to your first panel, and thank you for coming. <laughs>